Professional wrestling is a performance art in which two individuals work together to give the appearance of an athletic contest to a live audience. The contests contain variations, such as a tag team match in which two or more wrestlers compete against two or more other wrestlers, modified stipulations such as a reward for victory, or a change in the rules, as well as a change in venue, such as a contest taking place somewhere besides the ring. Prior to the contest, sometimes the wrestlers will perform a narrative which gives the wrestlers motivation for why they are participating. If this angle occurs in a professional wrestling company that has weekly television, the narrative could take place over the course of several weeks or even several months. Wrestlers take classical theatrical roles as protagonist and antagonist, babyface and heel respectively, to provoke the appropriate cheers or boos from the audience. Example, professional wrestling babyface Stone Cold Steve Austin is tragically struck by a vehicle and the identity of the driver is unknown. Over the course of several weeks, World Wrestling Entertainment Commissioner Mick Foley investigates the crime because nearly all matters taking place in professional wrestling narratives are handled internally. Otherwise, every surprise attack that takes place outside the confines of a wrestling match would be a matter for law enforcement. Commissioner Foley eventually reveals it was babyface wrestler Rikishi who struck Austin. This effectively changed Rikishi's alignment from babyface to heel in front of a live audience. Due to the popularity of the angle, it was furthered by implicating heel wrestler Triple H as the mastermind behind the attempted vehicular homicide, prompting another match. Throughout the angle, due to the clear instances of right and wrong, the audience cheers for the babyface, Austin, and boos the heels, Rikishi and Triple H. They have a series of matches, all of which are designed to elicit specific reactions from the live audience during the specific points or spots in the match. These narratives and these matches play out every week, and every week a combination of the writers and wrestlers prepare their narratives, matches, monologues, called promos, and other aspects of professional wrestling around attempting to persuade the live audience to react a certain way so that their actions are applauded and therefore universally understood by the audience watching from home. Who is the babyface? Stone Cold Steve Austin. We know this because the narrative, promos, and matches are manipulated in such a way that the live audience cheers for him, immediately instructing the audience watching at home who is the good guy, even if that person in the home audience has never seen Steve Austin before. Sometimes the live audience reaction does not go the way it was intended. When Rikishi revealed his role in the attack, he gave the audience his motivation. He wanted to protect The Rock, specifically The Rock's place as a main eventer due to WWE's history of favoring white wrestlers. This was meant to be a heel turn, but some people in the audience agreed with Rikishi's statements as the fictionalized motivation brushed up against reality. WWE course corrected and had The Rock refute Rikishi's claims in later weekly episodes which aligned future live audiences against Rikishi and put all the pieces where they were planned to be. Playing to the live audience is everything in professional wrestling. Unlike traditional theater in which the separation between the drama and the audience is a thin, invisible wall, the separation between pro wrestling and the audience looks a lot different. The pro wrestling audience instead surrounds the ring. The audience works with the wrestlers to create the show. The audience also works with each other to enhance the show, such as leading chants of the wrestlers' names or catchphrases. It's hard to imagine professional wrestling without the audience. What would that even look like? What would change? We got the answer to that question a few weeks ago, as social distancing suggestions and legal requirements prompted immediate changes to televised wrestling programs. New Japan Pro Wrestling shut down entirely. The American independent wrestling scene slowly faded out and waited for a return to normalcy. Weekly professional wrestling television in the United States, meaning programs put on by top wrestling companies World Wrestling Entertainment and All Elite Wrestling, experimented in shows with no audience. Empty arenas. This is not the first time a wrestling match has taken place with no live audience. For example, aforementioned wrestlers The Rock and Mick Foley, then going by the name Mankind, once battled in an empty arena match in 1999. Furthermore, some rare matches are more theatrical and highly staged than others, such as Randy Orton vs. Bray Wyatt in the House of Horrors match in 2017 that was filmed like a movie and without a live audience. But a weekly show with all matches in front of empty arenas? This was unprecedented. 
There was too much money on the line, too many contractual obligations with their respective television partners. Pro wrestling follows the old theater adage, the show must go on. But even if it were safe to continue wrestling during this crisis, and it very well may not be, should it even continue, considering how much of wrestling is built around the live audience? Professional wrestling, both the angles that lead up to the matches and the matches themselves, have long been formatted to play to a live audience. The live audience can occasionally detract from the festivities, but far more often the audience contributes to the matches. In fact, some things that wrestlers do are not only enhanced by the live audience, but are dependent upon them. One aspect of professional wrestling, particularly professional wrestling promos, is the call and response nature of it. When the aforementioned Stone Cold Steve Austin would conduct his promos and hype up his upcoming match for the audience, he would ask them to participate. A typical Steve Austin promo would involve him asking the audience, if you, and then insert something like, want to see me do this particular action or agree with what I'm saying, and then follows it up with a call to action, give me a hell yeah, to which the audience will invariably respond, hell yeah. Another call and response, a far simpler one in fact, is when Austin would say, what, to the crowd, to which they would respond with the same word. In doing this, Austin connects himself with the live audience, cementing his status as babyface, or fan favorite. The live audience sees themselves in Austin, and this familiarity breeds popularity and acceptance. This call and response is not relegated to Austin, as it is common among most major wrestlers throughout history. And if you're not down with that, we got two words for ya! A variation on the call and response is for the audience to recite the catchphrase instead of waiting for the pause to make their response. In both cases, the call and response and the sing-along variation, the live audience is absolutely necessary. On the March 16th episode of Monday Night Raw, broadcast from WWE's empty performance center, they played up the fact that there was nobody there to respond to his call. If you want to know what 316 Day is all about, give me a hell yeah! Without the live audience, wrestlers perform their promos under a different set of rules, but due to the complete unfamiliarity with these rules, wrestlers who have performed promos to empty arenas sometimes seem a little bit lost due to the lack of immediate feedback and the inability to feed off the reaction. As for the matches themselves, certain key factors in matches do not exist without a live audience. Wrestlers and the live audience generally have a symbiotic relationship that helps the match. Some of this is invisible, but some of it is obvious. One example is that a wrestler will perform various actions designed with the intention of causing the crowd to react and make the match seem more exciting, epic, and important. One common way is for the babyface to rhythmically stomp on the canvas or clap their hands in hopes of provoking the audience to do the same. As part of the narrative, this is the wrestler trying to garner support either for themselves or for the wrestler's tag team partner. The real reason is this is actually the wrestler trying to get the live audience excited because the match isn't exciting enough on its own, or as a signal to the audience that the match is about to have a shift in power, with the babyface turning the tide and suddenly gaining the upper hand. This connects the live audience with what's happening in the ring. It gives the audience the impression that they are participating rather than being passive onlookers. That way, should the babyface prevail, that is also their victory. In this match, on the March 13th episode of SmackDown, Nikki Cross instinctively stomps her boot on the canvas to provoke the audience and connect them with her partner, Alexa Bliss, currently being trapped by the other team. But there is no audience. Cross undoubtedly learned to do this a long time ago, and it's a difficult thing to just remove from a wrestler's repertoire, even though it serves no real purpose in an empty arena. On the March 24th episode of AEW Dark, comedy wrestler Colt Cabana performed the classic babyface clap to an empty arena before realizing there was no reason to do this. He may have done this on purpose as a joke, but it still illustrates the problem. One of the most famous ways a babyface wrestler can make their comeback is by hulking up, named after Hulk Hogan who would suddenly feed off the crowd to gain superhuman strength. In doing this, the live audience could feel as if they were responsible for Hogan's many victories. 
In addition to these flourishes to garner live audience support, there are also specific wrestling moves that require audience participation or always elicit a particular audience reaction. For example, sometimes a babyface will corner a heel wrestler and climb the turnbuckle and throw a series of punches. The punches are counted by the crowd, usually to the count of 10. It's only a series of ineffectual punches, but because of the audience participation, it's a big favorite among crowds. Without the crowd, 10 punches in a row form a fairly boring spot in the match. One way that wrestlers establish the babyface heel dynamic is dueling in a flurry of repeated moves, most commonly punches. The wrestlers strike one another, and when the babyface connects, the audience quickly cheers, and when the heel connects, the audience quickly boos. This is repeated until the babyface gets the upper hand, resulting in an explosion of greater cheers, or the heel gains the upper hand, temporarily deflating the audience and making them want the babyface to make a comeback that much more. Occasionally, the audience will react to the babyface and heel in an unplanned way, such as cheering the heel or booing the babyface. In this match from 2015 between babyface wrestler John Cena and heel Kevin Owens, it is Cena who is booed and Owens who is cheered during their dueling punches. Recognizing this wrong reaction and hoping to maintain their alignments, they quickly stop their duel of punches and Cena launches himself at Owens to move on. Without the live audience, this might have gone differently. The symbiotic relationship between professional wrestlers and the live audience is helpful to the wrestlers because it lets them know what's working, what's not working, how quickly or how slowly they should proceed, and so forth. In fact, matches are formatted with reactions in mind, and without the live audiences, the format is exposed in ways that can be detrimental to the action. Let's use a different and more accessible medium to better explain for people who have never watched professional wrestling. A traditional situation comedy will use a laugh track in the space immediately after a joke, and a modern situation comedy will not. However, the existence or non-existence is related to the format in which the jokes are written for the respective shows. A sitcom with a laugh track, and therefore artificial breaks in the narrative, generally allows for jokes to be structured only with a lead-in, punchline, and then the canned laughter. The laugh track makes it impossible for jokes to have rapid succession or an immediate comeback by another character. Singular jokes which require long lead-ins. A sitcom without a laugh track allows more freedom to tell jokes in rapid succession or have immediate comebacks by other characters, but they also require more jokes to be written as there is no canned laughter filling up any dead space following a joke. In short, a sitcom without a laugh track is not just a traditional sitcom with the canned laughter mysteriously missing. It's designed from the ground up to be formatted and structured differently. Thus, wrestlers in an empty arena performing the match exactly as they would with a packed arena is like a traditional laugh track sitcom with the laugh track removed instead of a sitcom designed from the ground up without a laugh track. Note the difference. The sugar in this is quite sweet. <laughs> That's your halt impression? I could hear him doing that. Pizza's on the way. I told you we wouldn't have to get up. What if we have to pee? Professional football player Lawrence Taylor made a WrestleMania appearance years ago, and though the match only lasted 11 minutes, he went on to say that it was more exhausting than anything he ever did in his football career. Wrestling is exhausting and the ring is not a trampoline. It's made of wood and metal and wrestlers land back, neck, and sometimes head first on it many times throughout the course of one match. Wrestlers need to rest or else the match will suffer, so the heel slaps on a chin lock or something. It generally needs to be a heel who locks in the hold. The audience is willing to watch a chin lock or headlock for a while if they think their chants and cheers and cries will help provoke the babyface to make his comeback and escape the hold. If the babyface slaps on the rest hold, then the dynamics change. The audience is not conditioned to cheer for the heel to make his comeback, and since all the babyface is doing is applying a hold and not really moving, there is nothing to excite the audience. If anything, he's upsetting the audience, hoping for more action. So, 
A rest hold in front of a live audience, applied correctly and at the right time, can excite the live audience, which in turn excites the television audience. It's infectious. All that needs to happen is a smattering of people in the live audience chanting or cheering for it to spread across the arena. But without a live audience, there can be no transmission of this excitement. The wrestlers are relying on each individual watching on their televisions to be personally excited by the least exciting part of the match. A chin lock or headlock now looks like what it really is, a rest hold. Even matches with few or no rest holds still have spots in which they're resting nonetheless, such as immediately following a failed pinning attempt or after one wrestler is knocked down. But while the fallen participant rests, the standing wrestler has been conditioned to use this time to rile up the crowd. If there is no crowd to rile up, the wrestler still standing will have to do something else to pass the time while the fallen participant catches their breath. Perhaps argue with the referee, but that's something usually reserved for heels. Without a live audience, a lot of what wrestlers do is exposed. Wrestlers communicate with one another during the match to prepare for moves, to remind them of what is meant to come next, and to warn them about any potential danger. Over the roar of the crowd, this is usually drowned out. Without the live audience, to drown out the communication, wrestlers can either opt not to do this anymore, resulting in potential problems, or just do it anyway and hope that the television audience does not mind seeing the curtain pulled back. Without the live audience, everything becomes awkward, empty. Listen to bits and pieces from this empty arena match. Darby is so spectacular outside, but he's showing us something on the inside here as well. He, he, wow. Wow, look at that over the top. He's like, he's like a piece of leather. You could just keep beating him and beating him, and he just keeps his shape. All right. Jump right through. And... Uh, the only way to push their matches into territory where they can never feel awkward is if they are constantly attacking, never resting, never slowly building the match to a crescendo. Movies can add music and elaborate lighting and special effects to their fight scenes, but wrestling can't have that, which makes the reactions from the live audience that much more important. This is Hulk Hogan vs. The Rock from WrestleMania 18, often stylized as WrestleMania X8. In the angle leading up to the match, The Rock was firmly positioned as the babyface and Hulk Hogan was firmly positioned as the heel. Hogan returned to WWE after a long stint in WCW as a main event heel and one of the leaders of the massive heel faction, the NWO. And The Rock was... The Rock. The most electrifying man in sports entertainment and one of the most universally beloved babyfaces in the world. Yet when it was time for this epic first-time encounter between the two titans, this dream match once thought impossible, the crowd was so excited that they eschewed their role as designated cheer section for the babyface and began cheering both men. The Rock even received a fair amount of boos. The ovation and the electricity in the air even before the match began gave us this iconic moment in which Hogan and The Rock, realizing what was happening in the crowd and what was about to happen between them, turned from side to side to listen to the live audience and to savor the moment. It was unexpected, and it was amazing. That can't happen here. WrestleMania 36 is scheduled to take place soon, and due to what's happening in the world, it can only be done in an empty arena. Vince McMahon, against the wishes of many people within the company, decided to go ahead with this instead of postponing the event. Several major stars in the company, like Roman Reigns, have opted not to participate due to health concerns. WWE and AEW have both tried to roll with the punches due to the obligations that they have with their networks. In spite of this, all of them, meaning WWE management and AEW management, are going to need to make a decision about the health and safety of their performers soon.